We're really church. How are you guys doing today? You doing good? Man, it's so great to see you, whether you're joining us online or in person. I'm excited that you are here today. Hey, check it out. We're going to start with a time of worship. So if you're able, would you join me in standing? And before um, we get started, I want to introduce you to Tim Brown, our new VC Campus worship pastor. So will you join me in welcoming him? We're super grateful that Tim is here. He is amazing. He's going to be helping us lead worship today and hopefully for many, many years to come. So before we get started, why don't you quickly say hello to someone nearby, be friendly, tell them, who you na- tell them what your name is, shake the hand, move around if you need to, and then we'll get going. Raise a high. 
out straight to Him. Oh my God, so good, you never give up, you never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found, because He loved, because He loved for me. And oh my God, so good, you never give up, you never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found, because He loved, because He loved for me. respond to your love and we respond to your faithfulness we respond to your many blessings you've given us over and over and over again in our lives so either everything's going awesome or it's the worst week we still have a song to sing because you are still good you are still holy you are still faithful 
you are still God. So as we sing this last song, church, can we just thank the Lord for who he is, for how he is still holy and he will be holy no matter what we walk through, amen? Let's worship him.
proclaim your faithfulness, we proclaim your holiness in every facet of our lives, not just on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning here at Vineyard Church North Phoenix, but Lord, in every capacity of our lives, in our jobs, in our schools, in our families, in our friendships, in our cities, God, that you are holy no matter what life throws our way, no matter what we're walking through. We can trust you, we hold on to you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, welcome to the Vineyard this morning. Uh, my family and I are so excited to be a part of the family here at Vineyard Church North Phoenix. We're looking forward to growing old together. And so uh, we're gonna be in the lobby after service. We'd love to say hi to people. We'll be here every weekend in August. And so uh, just come and catch us before or after service. I'd love to say hi and meet as many of you as possible because we're family now, amen? Amen. And so there's some family next to you right now. Go ahead and turn around and say hello to somebody next to you right now and then find a seat. What's up, everyone? Whether you're joining us online or in person, we hope you experience God's presence in today's service. Before we get started, here's a few things you should know. Are you new here? Fill out a connection card, drop it into the offering bag, and stop by the information center for our guest welcome. Are you joining us online? Just type the word guest into the chat. Either way, we would love to connect with you. There are many different ways to give to God through the vineyard. However we give, we are helping to transform lives, not only in our community, but all around the world. No matter where we gather, online or in person, here or there, we're so glad you decided to join us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the service. One way that everyone in our church can contribute to Compassion Ministry is through our food drive. Here's how you do it. Grab an orange bag, fill it with non-perishable goods, and bring it back. All you have to do is leave it behind your car when you get to church, and a friendly volunteer will pick it up for you. It's as easy as that. The amazing things that God does here at the Vineyard are made possible by our volunteers. Every weekend, it takes well over 300 volunteers just to put on our weekend services, not to mention everything happening during the week, such as our food and clothing bank, small groups, living free, men's and women's events, and so much more. As a small way of us saying thank you for making a difference in the lives of others, we have a special gift for you. If you volunteer at the Vineyard, make sure you are at church next weekend so that we can honor you. Strong relationships don't just happen. They're built with love, dedication, and the right tools. This seven-week course gives you practical tools and techniques to enhance communication and connection with your spouse. Whether you're looking to rekindle your romance or just keep that flame burning bright, the Marriage Course is here to guide you every step of the way. Invest in your relationship and discover new ways to grow together. Join us and see how the Marriage Course can transform your marriage journey. Vineyard Church, how we doing? Doing good? All right, awesome. Well, whether you're here in the room or whether you're uh, with us online today, super glad you decided to spend part of your weekend with us here at the Vineyard. Uh, if you happen to be a guest, if this is your first time, um, you're actually our favorite people. We love it when we have guests, and we'd love to have the opportunity to connect with you. So please let us know that you're here. Text the word VC guest. Visit the lobby out in the uh, in the the visit the information center out in the lobby after the service, so that we can meet you and get to know you a little bit online. Type the word guest in the chat so we can connect with you. Um, my name's Keith Shepherd. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I gotta let you know um, this is kind of a big month for my family. Um, in just well a couple weeks. Uh, our oldest, our daughter, is going to be uh, moving to NAU to start school up there. So please pray for us in this 
transition process and everything like that. Our son just started his junior year of high school. But um, the thing that I really am excited to share with you today is that this Wednesday, Allison and I, my wife and I, are going to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. She looks exactly the same now. I, that is me, I promise you. This is how it started, and this is how it's going. So if you happen to see her, you will recognize her by wearing a dress that looks exactly like this shirt. Um, please show her a little extra love from our church family and from me because she's put up with me for 25 years. So and that's a miracle in and of itself. Um, Thank you. I also want to share with you some really cool, something really cool that's happening this weekend. This weekend, um, we're having water baptisms in our youth services this weekend. Um, yeah, that is worth celebrating. We had several kids who made a decision to follow Jesus at youth camp this year. Um, several kids who recommitted their lives to Jesus and several kids who said, you know, I've never taken the step of getting water baptized and so I need to do that. So we decided to do a special youth baptism. You'll hear more about it uh, in the coming weeks, but I wanted to tell you it's happening today and that's something that is worth celebrating. And listen, this is, this is why we do what we do. This is why we partner with God to transform lives at this church, in our community, and all around the world. And it's, it's one of the reasons that we give. And we're going to give in just a few minutes here if the ushers want to make your way down to the front. But, you know, we, we worship together through our giving, right? We worship together through singing songs together about God and to God. We worship together by studying God's Word, by studying the Bible together. And we're going to do that in a few minutes. But we also worship together. We, we proclaim God's worthiness by giving from our finances. Because we believe what we have, it's all from God anyway. And so we partner with him by giving back to him from what he has given us. So lives are being changed. Lives are being transformed. And this is just a snapshot of it as we celebrate youth baptisms this weekend. About 20 kids are getting baptized this weekend. And that all happens because of us giving our time, our energy, and our money. And that is worth celebrating. So let's pray for our giving. Let's pray for our youth that are being baptized today. And let's pray that God would speak to us through today's message, okay? God, we do love you and we worship you. We, we turn our attention to you again. And we thank you for everything that you're up to. We thank you for the privilege of partnering with you as a church family uh, to transform lives, the people that you bring here, the people in our community surrounding us, and, and the people all around the world. God, I pray that as we give, you would continue to use what we give to make a difference. And God, we want to hear from you today. We gather together to hear from you. So would you speak to us as we study together from the Bible? God, I pray for myself that you would give me the gift of teaching. And God, we want to hear from you what you brought us together to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Over the last many, many weeks now, we have been digging into this series called I Believe. And we have been unpacking the historic creeds of the Christian church. We've been really zeroing in, focusing on one of the oldest written creeds called the Apostles' Creed, okay? And last weekend, I, we spent a long time really unpacking this, this statement that's a little more than halfway through the creed, uh, this phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And at the end of the service, I gave you a homework assignment. I know you didn't think I was going to collect, right? So who did the homework? Okay, did y'all understand the assignment? I, I got like three people that raised their hands. Did, did you do the homework? Don't lie to me now, like you're in church. Well, okay, we're just going to revisit last week's message until everybody gets the homework done. No, we're not. This is an ongoing assignment, okay? Maybe you didn't have an opportunity to take a risk over the past week. So the assignment was that we're going to pay attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And my hope, my prayer would be that we are a church, that we are a people who is known for the phrase, can I pray for you? And we know, are known for that phrase here when we're gathered together. This is one of the easiest, safest spaces to take a really small risk and pray for somebody. But that we are also known for that when we're out and about in our everyday, ordinary lives. That you would listen for that prompting from God wherever you are, 
that you would take a risk and you would say, hey, can I pray for you? Listen, worst case scenario is they say no. And then you just walk away and go about your day. It's all good. And you can pray for them anyway. They'll never know, right? They say, yes, man, you have the opportunity to, to who knows what God might want to do in that moment. So this is an ongoing homework assignment. I hope in the coming weeks, months, years, that you will take that small risk and ask somebody that you don't know if you can pray for them. But if you need practice, start here with the person next to you and ask them if you can pray for them. Not right now, though. we got some stuff to do right now. Okay. I, I can't tell you a story. I have a story. I do have a story. I just remembered. I heard a story this morning from Pastor Eloisa. See, she was having a kind of a bad day on Friday. And she needed a word of encouragement from the Lord. And there, you can ask her for the details, but it was frustration after frustration after frustration. Can you relate? You had a day like that? Like, yeah, we, we have days like that, right? It's, it just happens. Okay. She got the most amazing word of encouragement from a teenage barista at a Starbucks. Okay. An appointment from the Lord, a word of encouragement from some place where she wasn't expecting it. Now, my hope would be that we could be like that teenage barista and just have a kind word for somebody sometime. And it ends up being the voice of God speaking through us to someone else. So let's partner together and do that. Okay, story time's over for now. Okay. This phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit, that we talked about last week. Did anybody notice when we were looking over this whole thing that that phrase by itself is not a complete sentence? Now, I know I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's a complete thought. And it could be a complete sentence on its own, right? Right? It's got a subject and a verb, I believe. I mean, that's enough right there, I believe, right? There's a prepositional phrase, I believe in the... And then there's an object of the prepositional phrase, Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, did you not know you were getting a grammar lesson this morning? Are we good? We're okay? All right, okay. So I believe in the Holy Spirit, comma. There's a comma there. There's not a period there. That means this statement isn't only about believing in the Holy Spirit. We're rounding the corner on the Apostles' Creed. We're getting ready to wrap it up. And it's, I believe in the Holy Spirit, comma. See, that could have stood on its own. That's, that's a standalone statement. But for whatever reason, the authors of this creed didn't leave it that way. In fact, when we look back over all the statements of belief in the Trinity of God in the Apostles' Creed, we find something similar, right? We find when we read, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And we could have just said, I believe in God. Done. That's a complete thought. That's a complete sentence. But the authors of the creed thought it important to elaborate. They said, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Why? To bring clarity to who God is. Remember, the purpose of the creed is to state large, overarching theological ideas about our faith, about the things that we believe, into really simple and really clear language. I believe in God, that's simple enough to say on its own that I believe in some kind of greater, higher being than myself, and that's fine. But by including the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that reminds me about something of the nature of this God in whom I believe. It's simple enough to claim that I believe in a higher being, but claiming him to be a Father who is almighty not limited in the scope of his power, who is also the creator of everything that we see and everything that we don't see, the creator of everything that is visible and everything that is invisible. That is a much stronger proclamation of who God is, what he has done, and what he is capable of doing. And the creed does the same thing with Jesus. It says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Again, I believe in Jesus, that's fine. Complete thought, complete sentence. But anyone can believe in a person who is called Jesus. Anyone can believe in a person who is called Jesus, whom some also identify as Christ, as Messiah. But we don't just believe in a person called Jesus Christ, do we? We believe in Jesus Christ, who is what? His only son. He's the only son of, of the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. 
man, it's so much more significant than just a person called Jesus Christ. And it's not done there. Our Lord. Not only is Jesus the only Son of the Father Almighty, but he is also our Lord, our Master. The one to whom we have sworn our own lives so that he would be the true leader of our lives. And then we jump down to the Holy Spirit. And we are presented with a list of things that we believe in that go along with believing in the Holy Spirit. We're going to put this on the screen. Let's read this together. If you're able to, let's read this together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, if you listened last week, if you listened to any part of this series, I encourage you, go back, listen to it, get caught up, especially last week as we really, really unpacked that statement of that first part of this, I believe in the Holy Spirit, because it leads directly into what we're going to be talking about today. Because the authors of the creed felt it important to not just leave it as I believe in the Holy Spirit. When you look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, it is very clear that togetherness of his people really mattered to him. When we talked about this last week, when we look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, I mean, when I look at him, I, I want to be like him, right? I, I just, I, I love everything about him. He's our example. He, he lived his life the way that he did to set a pattern for us to follow. And when we look at his life, it is clear that the togetherness, the connectedness of his people, of the people around him was really important to him. During the Last Supper, the last time that Jesus would celebrate a holy meal with his closest friends and followers, he said this to them. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love each other. Remember, Jesus is our example. He's the one we want to pattern our lives after. And Jesus says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Then when the rest of the world sees how much you love each other, that will prove to them that you are mine. So how are we doing, church? How are we doing on loving each other? It's not always good, is it? Sometimes we don't do it well. Sometimes we get caught up on this thing or the other thing. And look, I know, those of us who follow Jesus, I know we got a big family. The bigger the family is, the more crazy there is in it. It's just the way it works. We got that crazy uncle, says that crazy thing, usually on Facebook right? But he calls Jesus Lord. We got this group that meets in this part of town and this other space, and they call Jesus Lord. We are the same people. And we're not always good at loving them, are we? I mean, sometimes it's easy enough for the people right around you, the people sitting next to you. Sometimes it's, you know, pretty easy for the people in your small group. I know you're in a small group, so you know, they're, they're generally pretty easy. I mean, except for that one guy. I know. There's one in every group. If you don't know who it is, it's you. <laughs> We're not always good at it, are we? The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And this statement reminds us of several things. It reminds us, first of all, that the church is holy. Holy means other. It means different. It means set apart. It means that, that this thing that we are saying is holy is not like some other thing that we're comparing it to. It means that this thing is different from another thing. And see, holiness is two-sided. We are made holy first by the work of Jesus on the cross when we choose to follow him. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, you were made holy holy. You were made other. You were made different. But we are also called to continue to live 
holy lives, lives that are other, lives that are different. We see this in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. He says, I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So we are made holy, we are made different by Christ Jesus, and we are also called to be holy. We are called to be a different people. Theologian Michael Bird says it this way, holiness is central to the mission of the church. If the church is to make a difference, then it must be different. At the core of the church's difference from the world, we find its holiness. The Apostle Peter reminds the church, quoting from the book of Leviticus, for the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. So we are made holy and we are called to be holy. Second, the creed reminds us that the church is Catholic or universal. That's what the word Catholic means. The English word Catholic comes through the Latin from a compound Greek word, katholikos. That word means universal. It's a combination of two Greek words, the, the Greek word for about and the Greek word for whole or entire, katholikos. And when we talk about the church, capital C, right? Capital letter C, church. We are talking about everyone everywhere for all time who call on Jesus as Lord. Again, same thing from Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. He says, I'm writing to God's church in Corinth to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. He identifies first a specific group of Jesus people, And then he adds into that the greater whole of Jesus' people everywhere. 2,000 years later, same story. There are smaller and larger specific groups of Jesus' people right here, right, right here, in this part of town. There are other specific groups of Jesus' people down this street, down that street, all over the city, all over the state, all over the world. So we are talking about both this church and the whole church, the universal church. The third thing that the creed reminds us is that the church is a people. The church is a people. All right. I know we already did a little grammar. I've got another language lesson for you. It's going to help us understand this better, I promise. We're going to look at two modern words, one in English and one in Spanish. First, hermanos y hermanas que hablan español, por favor, esta pregunta no respondan. ¿Está bien? Esta pregunta es para nuestro, uh, nuestros hermanos y hermanas que hablan solamente inglés. ¿Está bien? Gracias. Okay. Does anyone know the Spanish word for church? Okay. That's a few people. All right. Okay. That was, that was pretty good. All right. Hermanos, hermanos, hermanas, ¿qué es la palabra church en español? Iglesia. It sounds way better when they say it, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. It just does. Okay, iglesia, that's the Spanish word for church. That word, that modern Spanish word for church, iglesia, comes through a Latin root that goes back to the Greek word ecclesia. This is the word, when we read the New Testament, that is most often translated into the English word church. Ecclesia in Greek literally means an assembly or a gathering of people. Ecclesia, that's where we get the word iglesia. Okay. Then the English word church comes from an old English word that came through Middle German, and we see it in the modern German word kirsha, which means church, that goes back to another Greek word, kyriakos. Kyriakos is the possessive form of the Greek word kurio, which means Lord. 
So Kyriakos means something that belongs to the Lord. It means the Lord's. Anytime you read by the, the way the New Testament, that word Lord is the Greek word Kyrios. So we see from these two modern words, the church is a gathering of people, an assembly of people that belongs to the Lord. So why the language lesson number two? Because first of all, I don't want you to get tripped up on the word Catholic. It means universal. Second, I want you to realize the deep, profound significance of this statement. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Because what that statement is saying is I believe in that which belongs to the Master, the gathering of people which belongs to our Master Jesus, which is other and different and set apart from everything else around it, and which is also universal, which is a greater whole. This statement reminds us that we as God's people are bound together with everyone else who has ever called on Jesus as Lord. That's the beauty of this creed. It reminds me that I am part of something bigger than me. It reminds us that we are part of a family that has a history. It reminds us that we are part of a bigger whole. During the Last Supper, Jesus prayed an incredible prayer. And this is just a piece of it in John chapter 17. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, those who were there with him, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Who is Jesus praying for? He's praying for you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed for me. He prayed for anyone who would ever believe in him through the message of his disciples. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how you came to believe in Jesus. Think about it. You started believing in Jesus because somebody else told you about Jesus. That person started believing in Jesus because somebody else told them about Jesus. That person started believing in Jesus because somebody else told them about Jesus. Who somebody else told about Jesus. Who somebody else told about Jesus back and back through all the generations, through all of history, going back 2,000 years ago, until we get to this moment when these 12 guys with Jesus are gathered around this table because one of them told someone else about Jesus. You and I believe today. How about a picture of a family tree, right? We are connected to each other today, all around the world. And we are connected to everyone who has ever lived who believed in Jesus. Jesus prayed for us that we would be as close to each other as Jesus, God the Son, is to God the Father. And listen, I know we live in a deep, a time of deep division in our world. And that division has spilled over into the church. Our world wants to divide us along all kinds of lines. We're hit at every direction, almost every moment of our lives with with what we are for or what we are against or what we should be for or what we should be against. Are, Are you on this side of this line or are you on this side of this line? And hey, listen, I know. During an election season, all of the devices around us, all of the devices we carry on us are flooded with with ads and with posts about this person and that person and this issue and that issue and, and how only this one could possibly be the one to do the right things to get the job done. And did you know that this other one did this other thing that is absolutely abhorrent? And, and this, this worldly division is bleeding all over inside the church. 
This, this division that says, no, you have to see this the way I see it, or we are not the same, is bleeding all over inside the church. This division that says, no, 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 if you don't understand that, that this one person is the only one who can save us, this one person is the only one who is worthy, oh, 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 oh church, if we start using that kind of language, we are really, really missing the point. The world says, the world says you have two choices, option one, or option two. The world asks you, are you on our side or are you on their side? The world says, are you one of us or are you one of them? The world says that there is a line drawn in blood between us, dividing my side from your side, and you have to choose which side of that bloodline you will stand on and take your ground. It is enough to start to make us to believe that only this one thing, that only this one person, that only this one candidate, that only this one issue in front of us is the only thing that matters and that I have to decide. I have to declare what it is and who I am for and, and who and what and for I am against. And this line of blood has bled into the church. And in church after church after church, people are stepping on one side of the line or stepping on the other side of the line. And they have decided that those who are not on their side of the line must be the enemy and have no part of being in the church. The world world is trying to put blinders on us, on the sides of our heads that say option one and option two are the only options, and you have got to choose one or the other, and you had better choose the right one. The world demands to know if you are a friend or if you are an enemy, so you must declare today what and who you are for and what and who you are against. And in a world that says you must choose option one or option two, Jesus says choose option two. Three. Jesus says the only line of blood that matters is his blood, which he poured out for all of us. All of us. When the world tries to divide us, and I know we see those things sometimes and it, it gets our blood boiling and it's easy to slide down this slope. But when you feel that start happening, say, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Only one is worthy. Only one can save us. Jesus. I have got to choose Jesus. Remember... We are called to be holy. We are called to be different. We are called to be other than the world around us. Jesus says, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Jesus says, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. Jesus says, the only blood that matters is my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Church, let's not fall for the lies of the world. In a world that says option one or option two, let's choose Jesus. This next line in the creed says, I believe in the communion of the saints. Who are the saints? That's us. That's you and me. That Greek word just means those who have been made holy. The saints. If you've said yes to Jesus, you're a saint. The saints are the one whom God has made holy, and anyone who has called on Jesus as Lord has been made holy. To, believe that we, to say that we believe in a communion of us is to say that we believe in a common union that we all share. What is communion? Yeah, I, I know it's a ritual meal that we share in together. But why do we call this meal communion? Last language lesson for today. Communion, the prefix com means together, union is the active joining together into one. See, if we were already one, it would be community. 
because community is an expression of oneness that already exists. Communion is active. It means we have to choose to come together. We have to choose to join together. We call this meal communion because it reminds us that we come together, we experience it with God and with each other because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We share this together with the saints, with the whole church. Jesus himself instituted this practice on this same night, the Last Supper, the night we've been talking about, the last Passover meal that Jesus shared with his friends, the night that he would be betrayed by one of his closest friends. And we're going to practice it together now in remembrance of what Jesus has done and in anticipation of the day that we will share it with him when he returns. Luke 22 tells us when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now, I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So we're going to share this meal together today as a church, as a family. Online, uh, go ahead and get your elements ready if you picked them up at the office this week. Uh, otherwise, you just need a small piece of bread, a cracker to represent Jesus' body, and something, a small bit of juice or something to represent Jesus' blood. If you're in the room, now hold on, whoa, whoa, you're moving. You, whew, okay. You don't have to stop moving if you're already moving. Before we get our elements, they're available throughout the room. There's, there's, space, there's space close to you. We're going to take a little bit of time with Jesus, okay? See, Paul actually gives us a warning in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So let's listen to Paul. Spend some time examining yourself. Maybe there's something you need to confess. Confess it. Pause. Remember Jesus' sacrifice for you, pouring out his blood for you. We're going to sing this song after you spend a little bit of time with the Lord. Go ahead and get your elements. Just take them back to your seat. We're going to receive them together, okay? So let's pause. Let's reflect. Let's examine ourselves before we share this. See 
For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Father, we thank you for the gift of the bread that represents Jesus' body given. after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it father we thank you for the gift of the cup that represents Jesus's blood poured out for time that we share in it together, God, would you remind us of its meaning? God, that we would remember Jesus' sacrifice, that we'd remember the promise, the hope that we have in him because of his sacrifice, and God, that we would remember of these common things, these common unions that we share together because of our faith in close the service, I'd like to ask you to stand if you're able to. Ministry team, could you please make your way down to the front? If there is uh, anything that we can pray for you about, this team would be honored to do that. Online, our hosts are ready and waiting. You just click that prayer button and they can get into a private one-on-one -on -one chat with you so that they can pray for you right then and right there. It would be our honor to pray for you. And remember, don't forget we have an ongoing homework assignment. I continue to hope, I continue to pray that we would be a people who are known by the phrase, can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you for the things that you are doing. We thank you for the things that you are beginning that we don't even know about yet. And Father, we pray for moments this week, Holy Spirit, when you would speak to us so that we could step out and take a risk for you. And God, I pray in the coming days, the coming weeks, months, and years, as we continue to step out in faith and take a small risk, God, would you meet us there? God, would you let us see healing and miracles and, and just, God, let us be able to be your presence, be your voice to somebody around us who desperately needs you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you. See you next week.